and welcome to the fourth of our webinars about the basics of photography and getting off auto. This time I'm talking about ISO or sensitivity. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of She Clicks. So just before we start, uh, we have a quick word from our sponsor, which is Fujifilm. And Fujifilm has a scheme whereby you can hire or effectively borrow a camera or lens for 48 hours for complete, uh, completely free. Uh, and this includes any postage delivery. So, uh, you know, it's a really good opportunity. If there's a camera that you've been thinking about trying out, maybe the new little XE4 or the XS10, or maybe you fancy a GFX 100S, something like that, medium format camera, or there's a lens that you'd like to try with your Fujifilm camera, then take a look at, um, what is it? Fujifilm-loan.com. And you can book the kit that you want to use. You can select the date and um, sort out when it's going to be delivered to you. If you want to extend the loan, you can do that. You will have to pay for that for an extension. But if you decide to then buy the product, that will be deducted from the price. So check it out if you're interested in trying a Fujifilm product. Anyway, so thank you very much to Fujifilm for sponsoring this series of webinars. So let's start as we usually do with a quick recap. So there are several things that are connected when we're talking about exposure and it's really quite hard to um, sort of, you, obviously you can't explain them all at once and it's quite hard to understand them individually, but um, I've broken them down and uh, say so this time we're talking about ISO. In the next webinar, we'll be pulling everything together. And basically, if you just try and kind of remember each section, maybe revise it, and, you know, have a look again at the past webinars, and then hopefully, eventually, it will make sense. Now, as I said before, the numbers are quite strange. I think particularly when we're talking about aperture, this time we're talking about ISO, which is a little bit of an abstract concept, but the numbers actually are a bit easier to understand. So that's not so bad. And don't worry if you don't understand anything first time. Most people don't. It's quite complex. Most of us weren't born uh, understanding photography. You have, it's something you have to learn and it doesn't come naturally to everybody. It certainly didn't to me. And it's really tempting to switch to the auto um, mode because that just makes life easy. Nine times out of 10, you get a great image. But the problem is that um, you're getting what the camera wants you to capture. You're not actually getting your interpretation of the scene. So, you know, if, if two people turn up with exactly the same camera, both on auto setting, they're both going to get the same image. But if two people turn up in control of their camera, then you will get very different images often and you get different, uh, you know, different atmospheres and moods. And that's why we want to get off auto mode. So don't miss the next webinar because that's when we'll be sort of recapping all of the things we've covered and then pulling it all together. So let's, uh, this is another recap really, but it's worth remembering because ISO is part of exposure. What is exposure? Well, it's the amount of light that it takes to form an image. And it's controlled by the amount of time that the shutter is open, also known as shutter speed, and the size of the hole that the light passes through to reach the sensor, which is known as the aperture. The other important factor is the sensitivity of the film or sensor to light. And as I said, this webinar is about ISO and the next one will bring everything together. So what is ISO? I mean, it's, it's a term that we use a heck of a lot, but what is it? Well, it actually stands for International Standards Organization. And it's the, the, that's the organization that defines all the standards and publishes them internationally so that people know that when something is produced, it's the, you know, it's the same standard as something else which has got the ISO mark. Um, and photographic film was given a speed rating or an ISO number, or sometimes it was uh, an ASA number, but an ISO number, which indicates how much light it needs to form an image. Now, if you think about it, that's really important because say if you have a roll of film and you pop it in your camera and you take a shot and it looks fantastic, and then you put another roll of film in the camera, when you put exactly the same settings in, you would expect to capture exactly the same image, but it depends on the sensitivity of the film. And I'm obviously I'm assuming that the light is exactly the same. So by standardizing how sensitive the film is, we were able to understand, you know, how to use shutter speed and aperture when we're using a particular type of film. Now, digital cameras mimic these ratings by um, applying gain, because obviously when you have a sensor, it's got a fixed sensitivity. You can't actually change that. And um, 
you need to apply gain or uh, amplify the signal from the sensor to make it a visible image or to make it work in lower light. And it's a bit like, um, you know, if, if you're playing some music and you turn the volume up so you can hear it from further away or, or you know, so you get a, an audible signal. It's, it's a bit like that. You're applying gain to a, a, a signal that's coming from the sensor. So let's have a look at the ISO settings. Now this graphic is probably quite familiar to you if you've come to some of, several of the webinars and you see that I've got the, the tortoise and the hare. It, the settings typically run from something like uh, ISO 100 up to more commonly seen see 25,600 or 51,200, but some cameras do go higher still and we've got their 102,400 and 204,000 800 and those are extremely high ISOs. Now the reason the hair is at that end is because if that was film we would call that fast film because that would enable you to use fast shutter speeds in um, you know in the same lighting conditions. Whereas the slow tortoise is at the slower end and if you were using a slow film an ISO 100 film or maybe an ISO 50 film or 32 or something like that you could only use slower shutter speeds. So that's kind of where it got its name. It's similar to the reason why we call uh, some lenses fast. So as I said, doubling the ISO effectively increases the sensitivity of the sensor by two times. So going from ISO 100 to ISO 200 in doubles the sensitivity of the sensor. Halving the sensitivity effectively decreases the sensitivity of the sensor by half. So switching from ISO 400 to ISO 200 means that um, the camera is less responsive to light. It's less reactive. Now, why do we adjust the sensitivity of your camera? Well, first reason is to control exposure, because obviously, you know, if you want your image to be brighter or darker, you may have to adjust the sensitivity. It enables you to adjust the shutter speed or the aperture beyond what's possible with the current setting. So if you've got ISO 100 set, for example, and you can't get the shutter speed as fast as you want, then you could set ISO 200 to get a faster shutter speed or maybe an even faster ISO. So as I've already alluded to, high ISO and using high ISO settings allows you to use fast shutter speeds and or small apertures. And using a low ISO enables you to use slow shutter speeds and or large apertures. So if you think about it with um, something like a landscape, which isn't moving about, you can, and perhaps your camera's on a tripod, you could use a slow shutter speed and you might, and you might wanna use a small aperture um, and you'll be okay using a low ISO. Whereas if you're shooting something like sport and it's slightly dull conditions, you might need to set a faster or a higher ISO so that you can use faster shutter speeds. Now let's look at taking control of sensitivity and it's mainly done, well, there are several ways of controlling uh, sensitivity and it does depend on your, your camera, to be honest. It might be by the, my, the, the main menu, but more commonly it's by a quick menu or a function menu. You press that button and you'll see an option. It probably shows the number. Um, it might show ISO 100 or something like that and you can navigate to that option and adjust it. Some cameras have a dedicated button that you can press, which sort of is like a um, a shortcut to the ISO settings and some, a few cameras have a dedicated ISO dial and you can set the ISO directly using that dial. So there's such a dial and you can see this camera, this is actually the, uh, this is the Fuji XE, sorry, X-T2 and it's currently set to ISO 200 and you can see it can be set in whole stops up to 12,800. There's also an H and an L setting which I'll talk about later and there's an A setting when the A is for automatic so that when that is set the camera will select the sensitivity for you. Now this is um, perhaps a more common uh, type of uh, ISO uh, adjustment that you might see and basically this, this is on the Fujifilm XS10 and you would press the ISO button and that will bring up something like this on the screen. Well, it, will, it depends what setting you're on, but it will bring up exactly this. And you can see here that the lowest setting available, the lowest native setting is ISO 160. And the highest native setting is ISO 12,800. 
Now, the L marks that there are some lower settings. So a lower setting like 125, 100 or 80. And these settings, basically, they enable you to use slightly slower shutter speeds. But the, the manufacturer indicates, and here, sorry, we have the high settings of 25,600 and 51,200. And what the manufacturer is doing is indicating that Yes, these settings are available, but they don't necessarily, uh, they're not 100% satisfied with the image quality. They just want to give you a warning that you're not going to get the best results if you use those settings. It's useful if you need to capture an image, maybe you're only going to use a small, a small image, or maybe, you know, if you're gathering evidence, or it's more important to have a record shot than it is to have sort of high photographic quality. As a rule, you're best off sticking within the native range. There is also um, usually an, an auto setting. Now, uh, Fujifilm often gives you more than one. In fact, there's three on uh, the XS10. And these are really useful because you could be in manual exposure mode, setting the shutter speed and the aperture so you control the look of your images. But if you set auto ISO mode, the camera will adjust the exposure accordingly. So, you, so, so um, you know, if you walk into a darker area it will adjust the ISO automatically so you, you have the the control over shutter speed and aperture so depth of field and image and blur but the camera is actually controlling the ISO and it's just so you only have to think about two things rather than three things now usually if I'm shooting um, and there's three options I tend to use the first leave the first two at default but set ISO set auto three to um, something bespoke. So I usually set it to the highest available um, native setting. So in this instance, I've set, selected auto three. And what I'm going to do is I can set the maximum sensitivity and I've set that to 12,800, which you remember is the maximum native setting. And then you also have the option to set the minimum shutter speed. And I tend to leave that on auto, but if, for example, you know that you can't take a sharp shot at a 15th of a second or a 30th of a second or, or you know, a 60th of a second, perhaps, then you could set that. Or maybe there's another reason why you want to set that as a setting. Maybe there's a particular level of blur or sharpness that you want and you can set that as a particular setting or you can leave it on auto. I just want to point out also that you can see there there's a default sensitivity setting and you can also set what that is. And again, I usually set that at the lowest native setting because basically you're telling the camera, OK, I'm happy for you to go up to 12,800. But if you can, I'd really rather that you set ISO 160. So here's the back of a camera that has been set to manual exposure mode. You can see that because there's an M at the bottom there on the left hand side, just under MF, which means manual focus. And then SS, it's set to 125th of a second. F8, so the aperture is F8. And then you can see that the ISO is 1600. Now back, um, you know, when film was the main form of photography, ISO 1600 was actually pretty extreme. You know, you, just, you were expecting, um, you used to get quite grainy results, but things have come on a lot, um, both with film and with digital cameras. If you look at the scale on the left-hand side there, you could see that the camera is anticipating that the image I was gonna shoot, which is actually just of a gray um, scene, a gray ba background, um, it's gonna be correctly exposed. Now, a question that people often ask is which sensitivity setting should you use? And it actually depends a little bit on the circumstances, but also your camera. So you need first off to use the sensitivity that allows you to use the shutter speed and aperture settings that you want to use to capture the image. Generally, though, avoid the expansion settings. And I mean, both at the top and at the bottom. And the reason is, as I said before, that the native range or the standard range is the range that the manufacturer considers to produce the best image, image quality. Now, sometimes if it's really bright and you don't have a neutral density filter, it can be useful to drop down the um, sensitivity into the lower area because you want to, maybe you want to blur some water or you want to shoot with a very wide aperture. 
Um, alternatively, it can be handy to go higher up because, as you say, you know, maybe it's got quite dark and you want to shoot um, some action or you just want to capture an image. You know, it's, it's useful. High sensitivity settings are very useful for music photography, for example, because they're often, um, you know, concerts are usually quite dark. And if you can, often it's worth using one stop lower or one exposure value lower than the maximum native setting. So on the camera um, that was 12, the maximum was 12,800, it would be good to try and use uh, 6,400 instead. We used to call that 6,400, but uh, the levels have gone up so much now it's 6,400. So what's the impact of using a high ISO setting? Well, low ISO settings have the most detail and dynamic range, and that's because there's less uh, gain applied to the image. As ISO increases, more gain is applied and the results, um, this can cause speckling, which is um, known as noise. And if you think about it, you know, when you turn the volume up on your um, you know, on your hi-fi or whatever, as you start to turn it really high, unless you've got a really expensive uh, hi-fi, it starts to distort and you get, um, you know, you can get some crackling and it just doesn't sound as good as it should. And that is the same issue. It's, um, that's what uh, we call it noise in uh, photography. And it's often coloured speckling or chroma, spe uh, chroma noise or tonal speckling, you know, with variations in, in tone, in, in brightness, and that is usually called luminance noise. At very high ISO settings, you might get loss of saturation. You can get, um, sometimes you'll get a colour cast, and if there is one, it tends to be magenta, but not always, and you'll get a reduction in dynamic range, and in some extreme cases, you can get uh, banding. Dynamic range, by the way, is the ability of a camera to capture a range of tones or brightnesses within a single image. So if you if it starts to reduce, you'll find that it's the highlights are burning out quickly and there's no detail in the shadows. And raw files often show more speckling than JPEGs, but that's because um, they don't have any noise reduction baked into them. And this gives you the most scope to, to apply bespoke noise reduction in your software, you know, when you're editing your image. So if you can, if you're shooting at high ISOs, it's often best to shoot in raw files. As and that's because noise reduction is applied to JPEGs at the shooting stage and it's baked in. You can't actually pull more detail in. So I've chosen this image because this is a pretty extreme case, 409,600. There are higher settings than this now, but this shows you, this is a raw file with no, um, no noise reduction applied. And you can see that there is a huge amount of noise visible there. And you can see that colored speckling I was talking about. The, at some points, um, you know, in the dark areas towards the top there, it's actually uh, obliterating the detail. You really can't see very much at all. And it's quite, um, it's quite ugly. So here I've reduced, this is the same camera and I've reduced the setting to 6,400. And you can see it's not the sharpest image in the world, but, and there is a little bit of speckling, but it's more, the color speckling has almost gone. You can, it's more um, luminance noise that you're seeing now. And that image, I mean, it, it probably needs a little bit of um, contrast applying to it because it's a raw file, but it does look quite a bit better. Now, this is shot at 6,400 and it's a raw file and you can see a little bit of speckling at that sort of level. I mean, this isn't going to look great by the time it's been through Zoom and, you know, across the Internet. But there you go. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the grass on the left hand, the bottom left, you can see a certain amount of speckling. It's not really aggressive, but you can see a little bit. Now, if we zoom in, you can see that um, there is a bit of speckling there and you can you get um, a certain amount of detail in the foliage. And uh, this, this image was shot over quite some distance and it was a bit of a hazy day. So it's not never gonna be the sharpest of image, but just have a look at those distant trees and kind of try and commit them to memory. And this is the JPEG. Now, if you look at the, um, the grass that I was talking about, you can see that that speckling is, is more or less gone, 
but the grass just looks a little bit smoother. There is still some detail, but it's a bit smoother than it was in the raw file. However, if we zoom in and look at those trees, you can see that you've only really got the coarser details. Some of the finer details have been removed and that's an impact of the noise reduction. It's kind of struggling to identify what's noise and what's detail and you end up with a little bit of mushiness in places. You can also see it a little bit in the foreground trees or the nearer trees. So, those are all the images I'm going to show because they um, it's not very easy to show uh, noise across the internet, but there you go. Um, so for some homework, and I say I'm not going to mark it, so please don't send it in, but it's just something to try. Set up your camera on a tripod in relatively low light and put it to program exposure mode. Now, the reason why I say put it, do it in relatively low light is because if you do this exercise in um, sort of normal conditions, it does a really good job of masking the, what happens when you use a high ISO setting. They, they manage to sort of muddle through and, and produce better results, but you wouldn't use a high ISO setting in sort of half decent light. So you want to try and replicate the conditions in which you would use high ISO. So think about, you know, in low light conditions. Now set the lowest ISO setting and shoot an image, but if you could shoot a RAW and JPEG image, that would be ideal. Uh, and then increase the ISO setting by the next so to uh, by one whole stop. So if you're on 100, go to 400, and then take another shot, and repeat this until you've shot at every sensitivity setting or certainly every main ISO setting, and then transfer your images to your computer and open them up and have a good look. Have a look when the image fills the computer screen and have a look at 100% um, on screen and compare the raw files and the JPEGs. You know you 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 won't possibly won't notice a difference at sort of the lower settings, maybe 800 and below. But once you start to get over, say, 1600, 3200, you'll probably start to see quite a significant difference between the JPEGs and the raw files. And have a look and decide what top value you would be happy to use. And bear in mind, there are times when you might think, well, actually, you know what, I'm only going to share this image on Facebook and it's not going to be big, so I don't mind pushing up a little bit higher. But say if you were planning on making an exhibition print, you'd probably want to use a lower setting. And it's really good to know what sort of levels you're happy with, because that will help you decide. For example, if you're going out um, to shoot some landscapes and you think, well, the light might get a bit moody, you kind of get an idea of whether you really want to take a tripod or not. And, you know, maybe it might encourage you to do so more often. So that's just a little exercise for people to try. So we have a few questions already. OK, so uh, Kim says she's just joined. I assume uh, she clicks and she's missed the previous webinars. Where can she catch on, up on them for the next one? You can see them on our YouTube channel, uh, which is YouTube forward slash she clicks. And um, you can also see them on our website. And I thought actually, I, I think I haven't actually put the last one on the website, but it is on the um, it's on the YouTube channel, and I will put it on the, the website very soon. Uh, what is the difference between noise and grain? That is a really good question. So, um, with film, we spoke about grain because the way that film was made more sensitive was that the, the crystals that created the image were actually made bigger so that it were more responsive to light. And that made them uh, more visible. So when you had a negative and you, um, you enlarged it to make a print, you could see sort of larger uh, grain or grains. And it gave you that, gave the image that kind of granular look. With digital files, you don't actually technically have grains but it can have a granular appearance. So some people do talk about having grainy images and it's the same thing, really. It's, it's, it's a slight distinction. So um, noise for a digital image, as I say, tends to be either chroma noise, which is the colored speckling or luminance noise. And we don't tend to see chroma noise quite as much as we used to. It, it tends to be not quite such a bad issue, but obviously there was that image that I showed you earlier, which was a quite an extreme case. Oh, another good question. Is ISO 400 the same in digital photography 
as in film. Technically, yes, it should be. And it should mean that if you swap between cameras and film, you will get the same, you, and you use the same exposure settings for the same ISO, you should get the same results, but there's a little bit of flexibility. Um, and it's not 100% true, but it should be pretty close. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Valerie says she's found a Fuji X-T30 only seems to shoot JPEGs and not RAW files on Auto 3 and she can't alter it. Is she missing, missing something? Um, I know that some Fuji cameras would only let you shoot um, JPEGs when you use the uh, extreme values, sorry, use the exp ex expansion values. I think that's mostly changed now. Um, yeah, so I think I'm not 100% sure about that, to be very honest. It might be that you're, sorry, it might be that you're, um, you know, try using the ICE Auto 3 in a variety of, of different conditions, because I'm pretty sure that I have used um, Auto 3 and I've set the settings and it's it's been fine whenever the value is in a native range and I shot raw files so I'm not entirely sure what the issue is there. Oh, so Pauline says she uses micro four thirds and she wants to know if the sensor affects the ISO. Well it doesn't affect the value um, so it, it, in theory at least if you use ISO 100 on a micro four thirds camera and ISO 100 on a full frame camera you should be able to set the same exposure settings but you may see more grain in a high ISO. Say if you set ISO 3200 on a full frame camera and on a micro four thirds camera, you are likely to see more noise in the micro four thirds camera if they've got the same sensitivity. And that's because with a larger sensor, if it's got the, if, if it's got the same resolution, the same pixel count as a smaller sensor, the larger sensor, the pixels are actually bigger, which means they can, um, they can absorb more light or they, they gather more light, which means that the signal is stronger, which means it doesn't need as much gain applying. Whereas with the smaller sensor, um, the, the pixels are smaller, they gather less light, which means they need more gain applying and that results in more noise. So at the basic level, it's the same because it's part of the exposure uh, triangle, the exposure equation, but the end result can mean it's slightly different. Janet saying she, when she zooms into an image and see haloing, is that because the ISO was too high? No, um, usually it's not. There are two reasons for haloing. If you're sort of seeing um, it around a lot of subjects, it can be that um, this is tends to be post processing. If you've been processing, it usually means that the um, the, the, sorry, the sharpness is too high, you applied too much sharpening and that kind of creates a halo. But if you're seeing um, sort of magenta or blue haloing, so we call that um, chromatic aberration or fringing, then that is a different thing. And it's to do with the um, different wavelengths of light, not focusing at exactly the same point. So you kind of get like, um, you know, it's split sight, it's a bit like a rainbow effect, um, but you're only seeing one or two colors. And that's, that's what causes that. But it does depend on what sort of haloing you're referring to. So Kate has asked me to explain the difference between chroma noise and luminance noise Yeah, again. Yes, of course. Um, so chroma, chroma noise is basically the colored speckling that you get. And it, you know, it can be red, green, blue. Um, and luminance noise is uh, differences in the brightness. So it's, uh, and it, it can often, you, if you take the chroma noise out, you're often left with luminance noise and it's just uh, a speckling and it's much more acceptable actually it doesn't look nearly so bad and a lot of people if you shoot high iso images um and it's there's a lot of chroma noise then what you could do is if you convert the image to black and white which is a really sort of crude way of getting rid of uh, chroma noise you sort of it creates a more grainy image that we find it is sort of reminiscent of film and it can look uh, quite nice so um, that's that's the difference. So you'll still sorry when you when you convert to black and white, you'll still see speckling, and that is effectively what luminance noise looks like. Okay, so um, Karen's got uh, a Nikon Z6, and she can go to ISO fifty one thousand two hundred, and then jump to high um, 
0.7 up to 2.0. What does that mean? What that means, Karen, is those are expansion settings. So when you go to high point, high point three, that is one third of an EV up from 51,200 and 0.7 is 0.7 EV or 0.7 of a stop up from 51,200. So that's, they're all increments of the expansion settings. So I hope that I hope that makes sense. Someone has asked, would the same ISO setting for a crop sensor and a full frame sensor produce the same level of noise? If they have got the same pixel count, no. If you have got the same pixel count on a full frame camera, you will get less noise. Assuming it's, you know, they're both modern cameras with modern technology, you will get this, you will get less noise on a full frame camera because there is less gain applied you, because of the pixels being bigger and gathering more light than with a sensor, a smaller sensor because the pixels have to be, they're squashed in uh, a bit more. So they're a bit smaller, so they gather less light. So you need to apply more gain. That's me applying gain. Oh, Sandra said, could I explain HDR again? I didn't actually mention HDR, but do you mean dynamic range? That's maybe that's it. So dynamic range is a measure of a camera's ability to record a range of tones. So from the very brightest highlights all the way to the darkest shadows. Now. If you have a camera with really low dynamic range, your the highlights will burn out really quickly. So if you were photographing a sky, then a lot of it will be burned out white. And in the foreground, if there was a bit of shadow, it would be all blocked up and black and there would be no detail. Whereas if you have a camera which has got a wide dynamic range, then there will be detail in the clouds in the sky. You will see um, sort of subtle transitions in the brightest areas. And similarly, in the shadows, you will see some detail. So that is um, dynamic range. Someone has said that the maximum ISO on uh, D50 is 1600. Is this problematic? Should I be upgrading to something more up to date? Well, only if you're finding that it's limiting your photography. Um, if you're not able to use certain settings in particular conditions, you know, or, or if you think, I really should have been able to use a faster shutter speed in that situation and I couldn't because um, I was limited to ISO 1600 then maybe. But um, I say only if you're you're sort of coming up against the buffers of what you can do at that setting. Oh, so Pauline's asked if it's worth investing in noise reduction programs for micro four thirds cameras. Yes, um, I mean if you like to use high ISO settings then actually it's worth doing for any camera and I mean, it depends what you use. I, Lightroom and uh, Photoshop and others all have some form of noise reduction, but there are better systems that are, you know, or better software that is specifically a, a designed for uh, reducing noise. Now, uh, recently, uh, DxO introduced uh, its, uh, what's it called, uh, Deep Prime, and it's a fantastic noise reduction software. And the great thing is actually, it's pretty automatic. I mean, there are a couple of settings you can change, but you don't really need to. You hit uh, the apply button and what it does, it um, DxO does lots of anal analysis of camera sensors and lenses and it applies uh, what the, the manufacturer, what they have learned from all of that analysis and removes a lot of the noise and it delivers a really, really good result. Now, Deep Prime is found in DxO uh, Photolab, which is an image editing package. But the company recently brought out uh, software called uh, Pure Raw, and that can be integrated into your workflow. So whether you use uh, Capture One or uh, Lightroom or uh, Photoshop or any other editing software, what you can do is you um, you basically just drag the raw files onto pure raw or you copy them in however there's different ways of doing it and then you hit a button which actually applies um the deep prime the, yeah, the deep prime and then exports the image as a dng and then you can process the image as you would normally in whatever software you like to use so whether it's lightroom or photoshop or whatever so uh, that gets my recommendation because it works extremely well. And you know, I did some comparisons a while ago of various different softwares and it certainly gives the best results. Beverly has asked, would you advise using in-camera noise reduction or not? Well, um, 
Yes, I mean, I tend to use it on the default setting for, and that's what's applied to JPEGs. But if you think your camera is perhaps a little bit aggressive with the noise reduction, you know, maybe images start to get a little bit too mushy too early on, then you could try, it's often possible to reduce the strength of it. So you might have a look and see it set to standard, maybe set it to low or something like that. Okay, so that is the end of the questions now. So thank you everyone for coming along. I said it wouldn't be uh, a long webinar. Um, in about four weeks time, we will be doing the fifth webinar, which is about um, pulling it all together. So I'll recap on exposure in general. We'll talk about shutter speed, we'll talk about aperture and we'll talk about ISO and we'll talk about how it all works together. Okay, so thanks very much. Good night. <laughs>